Welcome to lecture five on, in our series on evolution and strategy. This lecture is on the evolution of intelligence. So in this lecture, we'll be addressing four questions. Uh, first of all, we'll be thinking about what is intelligence? Then we'll be thinking about how do animals learn? We'll be looking at a few different animal learning behaviors, but not, it's not an exhaustive uh, list. Uh, then we'll be looking about at how the human brain is different from that of other species. And why do we need intelligence? Right? Intelligence is central to the human condition. Uh, why do we have it? Why do we need it? So first of all, what is intelligence? Well, if you look it up, there are many different definitions of intelligence. But generally, they include uh, some of the following uh, attributes. Learning, reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, self-awareness, creativity, social and emotional knowledge, and planning. Humans excel at all these different aspects of intelligence, but other species demonstrate intelligence to a greater or lesser extent as well. Even bacteria can learn, they can um, react to the presence of a new metabolic substrate and adjust their metabolism based on that, that substrate's presence and the absence of other substrates. So learning of, to some extent can happen in all species. Um, but, uh, but it looks quite different uh, in different organisms. For higher level thought, um, you need the presence of neurons and their synapses, the junctions between them. These are crit their interactions are critical in enabling memory, in enabling um, decision making, and in enabling learning. So in a simple system, we can have a sensory neuron exciting a muscle causing a particular reaction. Okay, and this is a very simple uh, reflexive response, such as the nerve nets in sea anemones. In more complex organisms, the number of neurons and their interactions increase. C. elegans are nematode worms, and they have 302 neurons. We've mapped them, we know the position of every single one and how they interact with other neurons. C. elegans, even with this relatively limited number of neurons, are able to learn and have memories. So how do they do that with such simple um, systems? If we imagine that we have two sensory neurons on either side of an organism, they could be each attached to different muscle cells, causing the organism to move towards or away from a stimulus. If we get the neuron to synapse back to itself, it can propagate the signal and maintain it, effectively creating what we could view as a simple memory. Keep contracting the left muscle based on the initial stimulus. Now let's imagine that our animal is receiving stimulus, stimuli from either side. It would be a waste of time for both sets of muscles to contract and act against each other. What the organism wants to do is to just contract one side or the other. By adding in inhibitory neurons, each side can inhibit the other's action and prevent it. That way, if one side has increased stimulation, more stimulation than the other, then the side with more stimulation can prevent the contractions of the muscle on the other side, thereby causing the organism to respond on just one side. More complex systems with, can enable learning. A modification of the network can change the ultimate behavior. If we add connections here from the sensory neurons on either side, we, what we can do is we can change how, by increasing or decreasing um, the, these connections, the organism responds. Does it move towards the stimulus or away from the stimulus, effectively creating a pathway for learning? So we can see that even with very, very simple systems, we can incorporate some of these higher level aspects of learning memory, the ability to make decisions, and the ability to learn. Let's look at learning in a little more detail. There are two broad categories of learning that we can observe in animals, non-associative and associative learning. In non-associative learning, 
organisms ha- are exposed to a single stimulus and uh, there is no reinforcement involved. So examples of this are habituation and sensitization, which we'll talk about in a moment. In associative learning, in associative learning, um, we have two unrelated stimuli that are both acting upon an individual organism, and we do have enforce, reinforcement of the um, learning behavior. So this would include examples such as imprinting, when a young bird um, learns the song of its parents or learns to recognize its mother, operant conditioning, classical conditioning, which we'll talk about in a moment, observational learning, which is when one individual observes another and learns to mimic its behavior in order to solve, in order to solve a problem and carry out a specific behavior, or insight learning, uh, which is perhaps one of the uh, higher levels of learning. So first of all, let's talk about habituation and sensitization as learning behaviors. These are, remember, non-associative behaviors. So in habituation, we get a declining probability of a response to a repeated stimulus. Bozio and his colleagues in 2016 did a very interesting experiment with slime molds. So this is a slime mold in this picture here. They had a small bridge, the the slime mold on one side, and food for the slime mold on the other side of the bridge. Across the bridge, there was spread a bitter compound. But this bitter compound was actually not harmful to the slime mold. At first, the slime mold was relatively hesitant to cross over the bitter compound, but after several days of repeated exposure, the slime mold learnt to ignore the stimulus and would just grow straight across. This is habituation. A bit like living next to a train track and, well, it is like living next to a train track and learning to ignore the trains as they go past. After a while, you just don't hear them anymore. You've become habituated. Sensitization is effectively the opposite. This is an increasing response to either a harmful stimulus or a beneficial stimulus. These uh, worms were exposed, these uh, aquatic worms were exposed They're put in tubes and exposed um, to food being presented to them. The more that food was presented to the worms, okay, on regular intervals, the more the worms would respond to any change in their environment, such as a shadow, with increased feeding behavior. In other words, they started looking for food, okay, an increased response to this stimulus of of having a slight change in their environment. This is sensitization. Sensitization can also be um, an increased response to a harmful stimulus. So if we hear, um, if an individual worm was instead shocked every time there was a um, a shadow or something changed in their environment, then they become increasingly sensitive to any changes as well. And we get a bigger response to the stimulus. So what about associative learning? Well, uh, there's two classes of conditioning. First of all, classical and operant conditioning. In classical conditioning, an individual associates an involuntary response and a stimulus. Contrast that with operant conditioning, where an individual associates a voluntary behavior and its consequence. So let's have a look at these two in a little more detail. Classical conditioning was pioneered, the work on understanding of classical conditioning was pioneered by the scientist Pavlov. You've probably heard of Pavlov's dogs. Uh, What Pavlov did was he uh, showed that the dogs had an unconditioned response to an unconditioned stimulus. When they're presented with food, they salivate. If they're presented with a neutral stimulus, such as a whistle going or a bell ringing, they don't show the unconditioned response. Then, during a training process, during what we call conditioning, the dogs were exposed to both the unconditioned stimulus, eliciting an unconditioned response, and the neutral stimulus at the same time. The dog learns to associate the bell or the whistle with the food. And so after conditioning, the conditioned stimulus, which was previously neutral, elicits a conditioned response. When Pavlov's dogs heard the bell, they would salivate. So how do we recognize this as classical conditioning? 
It's an involuntary response. And the stimulus preceded the response. They had the stimulus and then they responded to it. And that response was involuntary. So that's classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is often called trial and error learning. When we think about how we learn, often it is through processes such as operant conditioning. If you're thinking about how you train your dog okay, to behave well, um, then you're probably using operant conditioning. A lot of the work on operant conditioning was pioneered by Skinner in the 1940s. In fact, this piece of apparatus here is called the Skinner box. Uh, you can see the way uh, that this box generally works. So we have a small animal such as a rat inside. And uh, this rat can be exposed to various stimuli such as lights or sounds. Um, they can interact with this lever here. They can be presented with food or they can be given uh, mild electric shocks. So using this apparatus, a rat, for example, could be trained to press the lever every time they saw a red light come on. When the light comes on, the rat learns that if it presses the lever, it will get some food. So this is a voluntary response. And the stimulus is actually coming after the response. So the rat has to basically use trial and error learning, okay, carry out the voluntary response, and then the stimulus will come afterwards, the reward, say, of gaining the food or the punishment of the electric shock. This is operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, we can have either positive or negative punishments or positive and negative reinforcements. A positive punishment is adding something to decrease the behavior. If, for example, you yell at a dog in order to get it to behave, you have added some, a punishment. So you're adding a negative, uh, uh, you're adding a punishment. That's actually a positive punishment um, is yelling at a dog because you're adding something to decrease the behavior. A negative punishment is when you take something away to decrease a behavior. So for example, or increase the behavior, we're just dealing with um, decreasing the behavior in this, in this column. A negative punishment would be to take something away um, and want it with the desired response of decreasing a behavior. So for example, if we take away an animal's food, that would be a negative punishment. Positive reinforcement can be used for increasing a behavior. So if we add something to decrease a behavior, we say if, we, if a behavior doesn't exist um, and we reward that if, a, if an animal behaves in the correct way and that is rewarded either by us or by nature, that is positive reinforcement. You do something good and something good happens, you do the correct thing and something is added to you. Okay. We can also have negative reinforcements where something negative is removed. Okay, so when something bad that was happening to the organism is removed, that would be a negative reinforcement, and the organism would then increase in that behavior. So those are trial and error um, ways of solving problems. But we can also solve problems sometimes just by thinking about them. This is called insight learning, and it's something that various species, including uh, COVID, such as um, uh, crows, are very good at doing. So crows um, are very, very intelligent. New Caledonian crows are very intelligent in the way that they are able to solve certain types of problems. So in this particular experiment, crows have been presented with a tube. And at the bottom of the tube is a small bucket with a handle and inside the bucket is some food. The birds can't reach the food by putting their beak down the tube. And they're presented with these pieces of wire, these straight pieces of wire that are long enough to reach down the bottom of the tube, but they can't spear the food. So how to solve this problem? How to get the food out? This is a kind of problem that trial and error working, learning doesn't work very well. Instead, you need to think about the problem, which this bird has done. He's fashioning the wire into the shape of a hook, effectively solving the problem in his mind and then carrying it out. Kind of 
trial and error learning, but all being done in the mind. So this is a really impressive intelligence, right? This is quite higher level thinking. Bird was able to solve a complex problem in this way. Wolfgang uh, Kohler uh, was one of the key researchers in establishing our understanding of insight learning. His work in the 1920s with chimpanzees showed that they have a lot of ability to solve problems just by thinking about them. In this particular puzzle, a, a researcher is placing a peanut, a small nut, into the base of this tube. Now the chimpanzee in this uh, video cannot reach the nuts at the bottom of the tube. So how to get them out? It doesn't have a tool to fish them out. So instead goes over to its water trough and sucks up a large amount of water, then comes back to the tube and spits the water out into the tube. Of course, the nuts float and they start floating to the top of the tube. By repeating this, the chimpanzee is slowly able to get the nuts to rise all the way up to the top of the tube. You think about that, this is particularly impressive behavior because water doesn't have a fixed shape. It's really surprising that they can do this, that they can realize that, okay, if I spit the water out into here, I can get the nuts to float out. This is a great example of insight learning, solving a complicated problem by imagining a solution and then carrying it out without trial and error. There are lots of different aspects of animal cognition that we can study. And there's so many interesting studies on these different areas. Studies on memory and recall and how that varies between species and what stimuli they're particularly good at, mem at recalling. That can vary based on their evolutionary history. We can also study cognitive bias, how organisms' response changes based on their emotional state or mood. And there's, there's some really interesting studies on that, reflecting higher level intelligence. We can study organisms' ability to communicate and rudimentary forms of language within species. We can study organisms' numeracy abilities, their ability to count and to calculate. And we can study organisms' intelligence in terms of their consciousness and metacognition. Let's just focus on those last two for a moment. One interesting set of experiments involves showing organisms themselves in mirrors. Typically what will happen in these uh, experiments is the organism's face will somehow be marked prior to the experiment. Then the organism is shown themselves in a the mirror. The idea is that if the animal is self-aware, it will recognize that it is itself in the mirror it is looking at and wonder what it is that's on its face. We then recognize, we then test for self-awareness by whether the organism then grooms or pays particular attention to that location on their face. Are they recognizing that the image they're seeing is themselves, and, and then responding appropriately? Of course, any experiment like this has biases involved. Organisms that rely particularly on vision are going to be particularly good at this. And that's been shown in that primates, for example, are very good at um, this self-awareness test, while other species struggle and perhaps it's not as fair on them because vision is not such a critical sense for them. Another thing that we can look at for higher level intelligence is metacognition. Metacognition is thinking about thinking. In various studies with apes, dolphins, and rhesus monkeys, they have shown the ability to answer questions with an I don't know response. When they're given a question they don't know the answer to, they can respond with I don't know, reflecting their ability to reflect on their own thoughts. In other words, metacognition, something that we would uh, see as a higher degree of intelligence. Now humans, as we mentioned before, are particularly good at all of these different aspects of intelligence. The reason for this, of course, is that we have our human brains. So what is it about the human brain that is special and how has this come about? What's so special about the human brain? Well, first of all, compared to our body weight, our brain is pretty big. 
our 70 kilogram body weight is paired with a 1.5 kilogram brain. If you compare that to a gorilla, gorilla's brain size is approximately a third of the size compared to them having almost double our, more than double our body weight. So compared to other primates, we have a particularly large brain. But size of brain isn't everything. Here we see images of a cow's brain and a chimp's brain. They're very similar sizes, yet chimps have high cognitive ability, they're able to do complex problem solving, and cows aren't, or at least they're really doing a very good job of pretending that they aren't intelligent. So the size of the brain isn't the, necessarily the be all and end all. Also, human brains weigh 1.5 kilograms. We compare that to a whale brain. Whales have a nine kilogram brain. Their brains are much larger than ours, and yet they don't show the same cognitive abilities. So is the human brain special? Is it designed completely differently? Is it laid out completely differently to other species? Well, brain architecture does vary significantly between groups of animals. In rodents, as their brain gets larger, each individual neuron also gets larger. If a rodent was to increase the number of neurons in its brain by 10 times, each neuron gets four times larger, well, the brain will have to get 40 times bigger. Compare that to the brains of primates. Primates have if they want to have 10 times as many neurons, the neurons actually stay the same size, so the brain only needs to be 10 times larger. This means that primates always have a significantly higher density of neurons compared to rodents, for example. Human brains have got 86 billion neurons, 16 billion of which are in the cerebral cortex, this outer layer of the brain. This outer layer of the brain, the cerebral cortex, is associated with a lot of higher level thinking, such as language acquisition, processing emotion, complex memories, complex problem solving. These are so this is all done in the cortex, the cerebral cortex. Our cerebral cortex has 16 billion neurons. That's actually more than any other cortex out there. So this is obviously significant in explaining our extreme cognitive abilities. A rodent brain with the same number of neurons as ours would weigh 36 kilograms, 24 times as much as ours. Imagine that, a brain 24 times the size of ours. Well, that would take something the size of a whale in order to um, hold, hold it. Okay, so the density of our neurons is important. Interestingly though, the density of our neurons compared to other primates is very, very similar. The only significant difference in terms of our brains, uh, in terms of that architecture, is the fact that our brains are larger than theirs. We have particularly big brains um, compared to other primates. So why don't other primates have similarly sized brains to us? Well, perhaps one of the best explanations for this is the brain's use of energy. Human brains use a lot of energy. We consume approximately 2,000 kilocalories per day, 500 kilocalories of which are used by the brain. The brain is only 2% of our body mass, yet consumes 25% of our energy. This is a huge amount, and that is a significant cost to humans. Why does the human brain cost so much energy? Well, neurons typically require six kilocalories per day, per billion neurons. If we have 86 billion neurons, that means that our brain requires about 516 kilocalories per day. If we have more neurons, there is a greater energetic cost. And so we're going to have to feed more in order to provide the energy for those, those neurons. Great apes have got a large body, and that's going to cost them energy. Okay, they need a large body. Um, it enables them to be um, fit in their environment. But the great apes do not have a larger brain. Why? 
Well, it's to do with this expense. The cost of the body, having a large body, and the cost of having a large brain is just too great. The cost of the body and the cost of the brain have to be less than the energy intake each day. You could spend more time eating, potentially, but nine hours a day is thought to be about the practical limit for most organisms. You can't feed any longer without risking your own survival. Let's think about this relationship between energy and body size. The larger an organism is, the fewer neurons it will be able to support. So if an organism is eating for eight hours a day, well, then this is basically the decision tree it ends up with. You could have 45 billion neurons, but your body can only be 50 kilograms. You could have 12 billion neurons, and then your body could be larger. Great apes, um, such as orangutans and gorillas, um, have typically settled around 30 billion neurons. But our brains, as we've already said, have 86 billion neurons. Our brains would just not be viable if we were eating like an orangutan or gorilla for eight hours a day. So how is it that we're able to support our relatively large bodies and these enormous, for a primate, brain? We're not spending eight hours eating a day. Well, that critical part there is that we're not eating like orangutans and gorillas. There's something different about the way that we're eating. We are cooking. When you cook, you're able to gain many, many more calories from your food. So you can consume more calories in less time, thereby increasing the efficiency of calorific intake significantly. That leaves enough time for other things, such as the development of societies, com communication, and other abilities. We notice if we look back um, at our hominid ancestors, that their cranial capacity and their, their brain size was significantly smaller than ours until where, where we believe the invention of cooking occurred. As soon as we were able to cook our food, suddenly our brain size was able to increase significantly because we were able to gain more calories from our food. And so through gradual evolution over time, we have got better and better at our cooking, better and better at our food chain supply, until now we've actually reached a point where we are consuming too many calories that our excellence at producing food um, that is nutritious is actually too great. Um, the irony, of course, of all of this is that in when we think about how to lose weight, how to reduce our calorific uh, intake, what do we need to do? Well, we need to eat more raw foods, just like orangutans and gorillas. When we compare the human brain to other primate brains, we have a lot more neurons than they do because we, and we are so are able to sustain a larger brain. We're able to sustain that larger brain because we can cook and we can get much, much more energy from our food. As our brain capacity increased, so did the folding of our cortex, our cerebral cortex. That folding enables greater specialization of functions. Different regions of the cortex can be specialized and dedicated to particular aspects of intelligence. For example, we have a region towards the back of our brain that helps us to um, process language. We have another area, a separate area, for processing speech. All parts of the brain are involved in multiple functions, but we get these areas of general specialization um, and that increases our cognitive abilities. So one critical question then comes as to, well, why have intelligence? Why is it that humans have these extreme cognitive abilities, yet they are not shared by other organisms 
uh, in the animal kingdom and the other kingdoms, right? Why is intelligence seemingly so rare? Well, certainly this degree of cognitive ability. Is intelligence the crowning achievement of the evolutionary process or not? Well, when we think about uh, intelligence, uh, we've got to appreciate, first of all, the fact that there's many, many organisms out there, by far the majority of organisms on Earth, that are doing extremely well without higher level intelligence. Okay, they're very abundant, they're spreading, their fitness is extremely high. So maybe being extremely intelligent is not, you know, the crowning achievement of, intel of evolutionary development because you can be very successful without it. So why do humans have it? Well, there's an area of research um, that looks into this and, uh, and, 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 and the reasons for uh, human neurological development. One of the uh, prevailing hypotheses is the social brain hypothesis. The idea that our brains have evolved to be large because of our societal development and the fact that we are interacting with one another and our ability to do so increases our fitness. This goes hand in hand with something called theory of mind, which is the ability to perceive each other's thoughts. We have a special region to think about thoughts. It's called the RTPJ and it sits just here in the brain. This image uh, was um, made by Rebecca Sachs uh, at MIT's Social Cognitive Neuroscience Lab. Here we can see this region of the brain lighting up as this individual is thinking about thinking, thinking about thoughts, and in particular, thinking about other people's thoughts. Interestingly, this is not an ability that is honed when we are born. It's something that develops over our adolescence. Children do not have the same degree of specialization in this region. As we, uh, we can plot how um, specialized um, this region is, and we see that it changes from the, ages of, from the age of five all the way up through to adulthood, as it becomes more and more specialized at thinking about thinking and perceiving the thoughts of others. Uh, one of the way that, ways that the MIT lab uh, are studying this is through uh, using puppet shows and young children. And they can, uh, they're able to study how this ability to think about thinking uh, is changing through adolescence. Our ability to understand other people's thoughts improves as we get older. One of the ways they've studied, studied this uh, is by um, puppet shows such as this one, where they will act out a series of events and ask a young child questions. So imagine that you're a young child, uh, maybe, and that you're watching uh, this show. So here we've got a pirate. We'll call this Pirate Blue. And uh, Blue, the pirate here, he really likes cheese sandwiches. Now, Blue wants to go off and do some piratey stuff, um, and he's going to leave, but he's decided he's going to leave his cheese sandwich on top of his treasure chest so that he can eat it later. So off goes Blue. Then something terrible happens. Oh no, a gust of wind comes along and blows the cheese sandwich onto the grass. Then another pirate comes along. Let's call this pirate Patch. Patch also loves cheese sandwiches and he thinks, oh, this would be a good place for me to leave my cheese sandwich on top of the treasure box. And then Patch goes away to do some piratey stuff. Here comes Blue. Blue comes back and Blue decides he's going to eat his sandwich. Which sandwich is he going to eat? Interestingly, a three-year-old, when presented with this scenario, typically will choose the sandwich on the grass. When you ask the three-year-old why, the three-year-old say, will say, because that's his sandwich. A five-year-old recognizes that Blue will be mistaken and will eat the sandwich on top of the treasure box. So something happens between the age of three and five where a child is better able to perceive and anticipate the thoughts of others. If we show the children 
than that the pirate goes and eats the sandwich on top of the treasure box. If we ask the five-year-old, why did he eat that sandwich? Why did he eat the sandwich belonging to Patch? The five-year-old is able to respond because he thought it was his sandwich, because he thought it was the one um, it, that he had left on top of the treasure box. The three-year-old will often generate a new reason why Blue chose that sandwich. For example, oh, the sandwich on the floor. He didn't want to eat his sandwich on the floor because it was dirty. The three-year-old is three-year-olds are typically not able to understand and what other people are thinking in the same way that a five-year-old is. So you get this significant cognitive development between those two ages. Interestingly, if you ask both a three-year-old and a five-year-old whether Blue should be punished for eating somebody else's sandwich, because he ate somebody else's sandwich, was he naughty and should he be punished? Both a three and five-year-old would agree that yes, he should, because he ate somebody else's sandwich. Interestingly, it's not until the typical age of seven when a child will recognize and say, actually, no, Blue shouldn't be punished because this was effectively an innocent mistake. He didn't know, so he shouldn't be punished. So we can see that we have this gradual improvement in an ability to understand the thoughts of others. So why does this matter? Why is this ability, this growing ability to perceive the thoughts of others, why is it selected for? Well, if you can perceive the thoughts of others, you're going to be more socially competent. Communication becomes much more powerful. The more socially competent you are, the, more, the higher your fitness will be higher social competency, higher, more greater ability to understand the thoughts of others is going to lead an individual to be able to acquire more resources, to acquire mates, to reproduce more successfully. And so will increase fitness. Anything that increases social competency would be heavily selected for. This ability also enables the development of culture and we get a positive cycle. Social intelligence creates further complexity, which in turn requires greater intelligence to navigate. Right? As our societies become more and more complicated over our evolutionary history, so greater and greater brain capacity was needed in order to comprehend everything that was happening. And greater and greater brain capacity increased fitness. Interestingly, this is also paired with language development. Language development facilitates societal evolution, but it also helps to drive it because language development requires significant cognitive abilities. If you are mastering, if you're able to master language, you're able to master communication. And if you're able to do that, you're increasing your fitness still further. So what are our conclusions? Firstly, neural networks can enable memory, decision-making and learning. It doesn't take a lot of neurons to do so. Secondly, in, in animals, learning takes many different forms. An animal's ability to learn can significantly increase its fitness, and that takes many different forms depending on the organism's niche. Thirdly, brain architecture significantly impacts our cognitive abilities. The density of neurons in the brain the relative size of the brain compared to the body, and the layout of the brain and its folding, which regions are larger and smaller, in particular, the large size of our cerebral cortex. Fourthly, increased brain capacity is energetically expensive. So our ability to cook is critical to our high intelligence. Finally, Social interactions both enable and drive the evolution of cognitive abilities. These go hand in hand together. It's incredible that we can think about and study our ability to think about and study. That one of the successful ways of playing this game of life that we've covered in this lecture series 
one of these successful ways, has in fact itself resulted in the ability to really understand the mechanisms of the game. As Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Thanks for listening.